Um, and there's, uh, there's clear evidence that if we look at patients with heart failure, there is um, the paradox about weight. Uh, and we see that patients who are uh, <coughs> underweight tend to die uh, more than patients who are recommended for weight, or those patients who are overweight and patients who are obese. And uh, this doesn't come just from observational data, but also come from interventional studies. These are data from Valert, where they looked at patients, uh, cumulative patients on uh, randomized to Valsartan or placebo. But the study basically uh, showed similar effect on mortality for Valsartan and placebo. So it's, uh, they looked at patients on uh, a different uh, uh, BMI values. And uh, basically, they found that uh, patients with uh, higher, B, uh, higher B, BMIs values had a better survival compared to those with, uh, who were more lean. So those patients had BMI less than 22. So it seems that a lower BMI carries an adverse prognosis, at least in heart failure. I mean, it seems also that in the overall population, this correlation exists, and that below 22, there is an increased mortality, Above 32, 34, there is a protective effect above the age of 65. Then when we look at the uh, in-hospital patients, we see that the, uh, this correlation, the correlation between BMI and uh, BMI mortality is independent of left ventricular function. And in fact, if we take patients with uh, um, preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction, we see that again, patients were more lean and uh, the, the uh, BMI less than 20 tend to have a higher mortality compared to those who are obese. So there is a clear correlation between low weight and increased mortality. So that led to uh, extrapolate also the importance of loss of weight and the importance of cachexia. Cachexia was uh, recognized as an important comorbidity in several conditions, like uh, especially um, uh, HIV, also cancer, renal failure, but now it's becoming more and more important in patients with COPD and heart failure. Now, and uh, <coughs> Andrew Coates and uh, Stephen Hanker reported already uh, 16 years ago the fact that uh, if you look at the survival of patients with uh, cachexia, defined as patients at that time, as patients were, who, lo who lose more than 7% of body mass of body mass in the past six months, you have a, an increased uh, mortality as compared with those, to those patients who are stable in their body weight. So it seems that if you have a patient that suddenly starts to lose weight, either inten unintentionally, that patient tends to probably, probably as, a, as a worse prognosis. So, cachexia is defined as the international guidelines as a non edematous weight loss greater than 6% today uh, of previous normal weight over a period of more than six months. And that is often correlated to a reduction of both lean and <coughs> fat tissue. Sometimes it's re related to anorexia, anorexia and malnutrition, but when it's related to anorexia and malnutrition, it's reversible once food is supplied. But the problem is that when there is this loss of fat and muscle mass loss with anorexia and malnutrition, what, what happens is that you lose muscle mass and then when you start the aliment to give food again, you put on fat mass but you lose muscle mass. In patients that have cachexia, and uh, where cachexia is related to heart failure, there is a, there, there is a different condition because uh, uh, anorexia and malnutrition have an importance. But that anorexia and uh, that is partly related to the underlying disease is also associated with uh, a direct effect of cytokines on muscle mass and on, um, on body fat. Um, again, Stefan Anker, uh, several years ago, reported that patients with uh, cachexia have a significantly reduced quadricep, uh, quadriceps muscle cross-sectional area, and that that is associated with uh, a significant reduction in uh, muscle strength. 
So pa these patients have a significant reduction in, uh, uh, in uh, muscle mass and muscle strength. And you may well understand that patients with, uh, with reduced functional capacity that lose muscle mass and muscle, muscle and functionality further worsen their, their functional capacity by, uh, by, uh, by losing muscle mass. But also what is important is that they don't only lose muscle mass, they also lose total bone mineral density, bone content, fat content, and lean fat tissue content. So part of the uh, problem in these patients is uh, related to the malnutrition, but also uh, it has been reported that patients with, with heart failure, they um, tend to have enamel absorption, they tend to have an edema of the bowels, and this edema of the bowels tend to, uh, to induce an, um, um, uh, on one side malabsorption and denutrition, but on the other side the, um, uh, the absorption of cytokines. And that uh, further uh, enhances the uh, effect on muscle mass. On the other side, we have cellular hypoxia that has an effect on humoral and, hum and immune mechanisms that tend to increase TNF-alpha uh, levels. So the cardiac dysfunction on one side has an effect on tissue hyperperfusion, on the other side induces hypoxia. So the hypoperfusion has a direct effect on the anabolic-catabolic imbalance, causing a direct effect on the hormonal axis that will further element the uh, effect on the anabolic-catabolic imbalance. On the other side, has an effect on sympathetic activation that uh, um, also in, uh, increases cytokine activation. Hypoxia per se has also an effect on oxidative stress that increases cytokine activation. All of these, the result of this of all of this cytokine activation is the increase in IL-6 and an increase in TNF-alpha. IL-6 and TNF-alpha have been shown to have a direct effect on muscle mass and reduce directly muscle mass. So, in patients with uh, uh, chronic heart failure, where the cachexia has been mainly studied, there is an, uh, an imbalance in catabolic state. You can clearly see that patients with uh, cachexia, patients with uh, uh, chronic heart failure, compared to controls and to other disease, disease stages, they have an increased levels of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and increased levels of tumor necrosis of uh, and an increased level of cortisol. On the other hand, they also have an increased levels of growth hormone, while the levels of GF1 uh, uh, are reduced, as the levels of insulin and the levels of DHEA. So that tells you that they, on one side there is an increase of the catabolic state, on the other side the anabolic state is reduced. What is in interesting is also that therapies that have been proven to be effective in improving survival in patients with heart failure, they also tend to improve and increase weight. If we look at the effect of ACE inhibitors and beta, beta blockers on body weight, we see that increase, they increase weight. Ibuprofen increases body weight. Uh, the uh, of interest, the nanocorticoid receptor antagonists, they do not reduce body weight, they have a neutral effect on body weight in patients who have an improvement in survival, while you would expect by their diuretic effect a reduction in body weight. So it, it has been suggested that for patients with uh, cachexia, uh, you enhance the nutritional support uh, in the very end stages and uh, most of you would be familiar with patients who are very cachectic with a BMI below um, 16. You're, uh, it's uh, the enteral is, uh, nutrition should be preferred to the parenteral nutrition. Then uh, what is important is to avoid the fluid uh, uh, overload. That is always important. And uh, it is important to give uh, 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 usually uh, 35 kilocalories per kilo per, kilo per day of protein 
and that is important. You need to give uh, a protein diet, but what is important for the protein diet is uh, tend to give more essential amino acids rather than uh, just general protein diet because uh, if you give uh, an excess of protein diet then you can have a deleterious effect on the kidney while if you give uh, uh, an essential amino acids you don't have any uh, uh, effect on the kidney then uh, you have to give a glucose lipid ratio of 70 to 30 percent uh, as i said the amino acid enriched mixtures and also what is important regarding drugs i said already uh, the effect of uh, uh, ACE inhibitors and beta block, uh, blockers. In the extreme case, you may want to give appetite stimulants. Uh, we have two drugs that have neutral effects on uh, um, cardiac functions, like magistral acetate and medrosoprogesterone acetate, and therefore can be used uh, safely in order to induce, uh, to stimulate ap uh, appetite. And what is important also is that testosterone can be uh, safely used in patients with um, heart failure. Uh, we and others have shown that in patients with uh, heart failure, testosterone has a positive effect on cachexia, but also has a positive effect on um, um, exercise capacity, uh, muscle strength, as shown by isometric strength, MVO2 uh, with neutral effect on left ventricular function, and uh, an improvement in uh, um, a glucose metabolism. This has been shown both in men and also in uh, women. Uh, in women, basically, we gave uh, uh, a patch to this uh, device just for women with the uh, hyposexual uh, desire disorder, and uh, this only 300 micrograms of testosterone per day. So, in conclusion, cachex is a common. Uh, it's, it's very common in uh, end-stage heart failure uh, and what is important is worsens the already limited exercise capacity in these patients and uh, you can detect uh, cachexia or the, in the, the, the heart adult cachexia when you see a patient that start losing weight without having uh, a clear cause for that lo 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 weight loss and it's important to act as soon as possible. The interventions that improve mortality and morbidity in heart failure have been shown to increase body weight, but it's important also to use other interventions as early as possible in order to limit the reduction in body weight. But also, it is important to identify functional parameters that may represent a surrogate to mortality and morbidity for further drug development in the future, for, uh, to, to find drugs that be, can be effective for patients in heart failure, and there are uh, drugs like uh, anti-myostatins or drugs that act directly on muscle mass that are under development. Thank you very much for your attention. There is a growing literature uh, talking about frailty in these patients, especially when they're looking at advanced therapies such as VADs and transplants. Do you do the, such okay. assessments and do you think they're uh, uh, hyper focus or, or should we be doing more of those? Yeah, I think that, that is extremely important and I think that the, these new therapies, especially the uh, ghrelin or the anti myostatins these are the therapies that should be tested in, uh, in these patients because it's that uh, they may improve dramatically the clinical conditions of frail patients and uh, because uh, on one side we have the uh, poor cardiac function but on the other the other side we have the poor muscular activity because if you lose uh, uh, say 30 percent 40 percent of your muscle mass then it's, uh, it's like going uphill with the same car with uh, two less cylinders so it's uh, and so it's uh, it it, it, uh, it gets uh, it gets more difficult. And then another question, and I know we have a question. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you just mentioned in one of your slides regarding the evabriding and it increased the uh, the body weight. 
Uh, what we know that ivabradin is one of the drugs that act on the funny channel of the SA node by reducing the heart rate without interfering with the blood pressure. I'm just wondering on uh, which mechanism that it's going to increase the body weight, and it is recommended in the cardiac uh, cataxia. And it's uh, all the observations in uh, with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and dibabradin uh, are just coming and have been uh, accumulated as, as postdoc analysis. Uh, they didn't look specifically, uh, and this is something that has been formulated just because now there are two beta blockers that have been uh, developed, uh, two beta blockers and one ACE inhibitor that have been tested in patients with cancer cachexia, and uh, therefore uh, people are interested in uh, looking at the effect of, cancer dr of uh, cardiac drugs into uh, on body weight, but nobody has. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I've, I've looked into the direct effect on, uh, uh, of these drugs on uh, body weight. For some of the beta blockers, there is a beta-1 stimulating, central stimulating effect, like a foroxprenolol, but for the others, there's no clear explanation. Right, so they might be promising enough, yeah. really. Thank you. You've suggested enteral feeding, and there is a very strong evidence in cardiac ejexia that the cellular hypoxia and separation of cells and malabsorption. How do you think that should be overcome? Yeah, you know, the, 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 I think that the, 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 mal, the malabsorption is, uh, is there, but it's, uh, if you underfeed that uh, you still reduce the amount of uh, absorption. So you need to overfeed in order to have at least an absorption of a percentage. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the new areas where uh, people are looking into is the combination of uh, uh, supplements with microbiota. Uh, because what the, the problem is not just the, ed uh, the uh, mucosal edema, but also the changes in microbiota. Uh, uh, the German group, has, uh, uh, the Charité group, has uh, shown that there, was, there is a big change in uh, gut microbiota that is responsible for the changes in gut permeability. And uh, they've also shown that if you change the microbiota, you can change also the permeability. So probably uh, one of the way of overcoming that in the, in, in the future is to couple the, enter, uh, the enteral nutrition with the changes in microbiota. Thank 